us never lose sight of that reality. That the cross did it all. And the reason for the cross was your love for us, Lord. May we keep that in mind as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. I think, I think it's important to, to, to just kind of reorient our um, focus at this point in Revelation. We're about halfway through. We're in chapter 11, and there's 22 chapters in Revelation. What's half, what's half, of, tw- half of 22? 11, right? So we're right there in the middle. It's always good to reorient <coughs> excuse me, our, um, our direction. Man, this pollen been hitting different this year, hasn't it? Like, it's too early. Yeah, my, my driveway is yellow, man. It's too early for that. It's all, it ain't even spring yet. But uh, you'll have to excuse me this morning because I am beset by the pollen. Um, there, there was, I was speaking, you know, I, I, try to, I try not to limit God's voice. Are you with me this morning? Um, I do believe that you have to be discerning when you are reading the Sabbath school lesson. Amen. I believe you have to be discerning in all um, encounters of life. But I also think that that if we do not learn from our brothers and sisters around the world, then we we lack a certain um, richness to our understandings. I was speaking to a shaman. Do you know what a shaman is? A lot of cultures around the world that, that, um, that practice shamanism. We go to church, right? We go and, and then our, what our, the, 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 the comparative office of a shaman would be the pastor, right? We just go to the church each week and we get our teaching or we get our um, lessons or our encouragement, those type of things. We have it scheduled, right? A lot of cultures, they practice shamanism in that the shaman will come when needed, Right? You've probably been taught things about shamanism which aren't necessarily always accurate because shaman isn't necessarily a specific practice, but it's an office, which is similar to a pastor or a prophet. Are you with me this morning? So I was speaking to a, a shaman and um, just asking him questions, trying to learn about um, his culture and the way they do things. And my ignorance showed up. My United States... American ignorance showed up, and I didn't even realize it, and it happens a lot. And if you approach things humbly, people, when your ignorance shows up when you're speaking cross-culturally, usually people will be gracious and understand you're just trying to learn. If you don't, that's where we fall short usually as Americans or people who spend a lot of time in the U.S. is that we go places often feeling like we are better than others instead of humbling ourselves. Uh, but if you humble yourself and your ignorance showed up, people are usually gracious. So my ignorance showed up. And I just assumed that shamans predict the future and are a lot like maybe a fortune teller, right? So in our conversation, he then began to correct me. He said, you know, something that, that, that happens a lot of times is tourists show up and they, they think that I am a fortune teller. And they come to me and they want to know when stuff is going to happen and how it's exactly how it's going to happen. He said, but my purpose really is just to acquaint people with their purpose for life and how they fit into the overall picture of the creator and creation and how to function within their purpose. That's my point. And, and, and I said, well, well, I'm, I'm ignorant because <laughs> I definitely thought you were telling people fortunes. And I came here with a certain mindset of your... I didn't say this, but I was thinking I came with a certain mindset of his incorrectness because I thought he was essentially a fortune teller when at the end of the day, he's really just an encourager, right? But, 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 he, but him saying that his goal is not to tell the fortune, but to help people understand where they fit in the overall picture of the creator and creation really set in my heart. And as we read Revelation, I think a lot of times we get caught up in the date setting. You see, you see where I'm going with this. We think Revelation is about the dates. So we're going to see today, we're going to see 538 um, um, BC or BCE, whichever academic tradition you're from. We're going to see 538 BC. We're going to see 1798 AD. 
We've already seen 1844, and we've seen some other dates, and we're going to see some dates. But understand, it's not about the dates. Are you hearing me this morning? It's not about the dates. It might be about what Jesus was doing on those dates. But ultimately, it is about the big picture of the gospel of what Jesus is doing to save your hips. Are you with me this morning? So as we visit dates, let's not get caught up in the dates. Can we do that? But can we get caught up in what Jesus is doing and how we fit into his plan? Amen? Amen. Media team, can I get, can I get that uh, the PowerPoint on the screen? Is that up? No. There we go. Thank you, media team. I'll start Elder Williams up there doing the thing. Appreciate you. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Can we pray again? Lord, we, we thank you that you're doing a thing. We thank you that you've been doing it since you were the lamb slain from the foundations of the world, Lord. And you continue to this day to work out your will on this earth, in our hearts, Lord, and in the universe as a whole, God. We thank you that you never cease to work in the lives of those who love you and those who you are calling into a relationship with you, Lord. May we see that clearly in Jesus' name. Amen. Our summary of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ and his activities on behalf of his people as history comes to its close. The book of Revelation is the what? Unveiling. Of Jesus, right? And his what? On behalf of who? As history comes to its close. Amen. Uh, last session we learned it is God's prerogative, what he reveals and doesn't reveal to humanity. Amen? You ain't God. Come on now. That's why we should never feel like we, we know everything because it's his prerogative, what he does and doesn't reveal, Right? And even what he's revealed, you ain't got it all figured out yet. Neither do I. None of us do. So never feel like you, 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 like you know it all. Uh, the little scroll in Revelation 10 is a portion of the larger scroll in Revelation 5. That was mentioned in Revelation 5. Remember that only Jesus was worthy to open it, right? Uh, we saw that God swears an oath of commitment to his last day people. We saw the mighty angel, right, the seven thunders, those type of things. We saw that God swears an oath of commitment to his last day people, which ought to encourage you because the beast might make some noise. Come on now. Second beast might make some noise. Come on now. Babylon might shake and, and do, some, do some dirty stuff. But at the end of the day, if the, if the creator of the world has swore an oath to you, you have nothing to fear. God's word is sweet. But the treatment received by those who proclaim his word can, at times, be bittersweet. And we saw that at the great disappointment, right? But that's not the only time in history when God's people have seen the sweetness of his word and then had bittersweetness. And we even went to Jeremiah. Saw that Jeremiah experienced it long before 1844, but it was experienced in 1844, amen? Uh, the, we saw that the contents of the seventh trumpet are revealed in the remainder of Revelation, chapters 12. To 22, and that is the finishing of the mystery of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This session, we will learn that God draws a distinct line based on what? Worship. God's people are God's last day gospel what? Witnesses. Jesus never does what? Abandons his persecuted people. And we will see the finishing of the mystery of God beginning. Um, Real quick, media team, I think this is the last slide until you'll be able to put the, the, the shot of uh, the camera back on the, on the, on the screen. You're, you remember where we've been at. This has happened repeatedly in Revelation. It started in the first few chapters of Revelation with the churches, and, and the first chapter would remind us that it's related, Revelation of Jesus Christ, and then we saw the, 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 the four horsemen, right? You remember this? We saw that there's no need to be afraid. Jesus has all the power, even over death and Hades. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus has overcome. The Holy Spirit is available to you and I. Amen. We saw that if you reject Jesus, it leads to spiritual famine, which ultimately leads to spiritual death. But we saw that if you accept Christ, you have peace that passes understanding, and you will be complete in him. 
the first half of Revelation is just that over and over and over and over again in different ways, over and over and over again, telling you, choose a side and the choice is obvious over and over again. Revelation 11, you ready? Um, verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship, worship there. This cannot be referring to the actual temple, because at the time that John wrote this, the temple had been destroyed, right? The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, right? So at, this, at the time Revelation was written, the, 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 the temple was gone. So apparently the temple is being referred to, and most of you understand this, is the temple in heaven. Uh, we see that referred to also in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 42. Uh, the word measure here, materio, excuse me, metrio, describes an evolution, excuse me, an evaluation or judgment. This refers in the New Testament, this word always refers in the New Testament to the judicial work of God in last day judgment. We saw it in Matthew chapter 7, happens again in Mark chapter 4. Again, I'm throwing scriptures at you, right? You have this available, right? The, the, it's on you, the presentation will be on YouTube, and also you can download uh, the PowerPoint. Um, it's a study at your own leisure. Man, I'm losing some of y'all already. Goodness gracious. See about half a dozen nodding heads. Praise God. <laughs> we're going to eat after this. So hang with me. Hang with me for about 20 more minutes, and we're going to be good. This, today's slides, are only, it's only about 28 slides, so it's a quick presentation. Uh, when John was writing this, to the Jews at the time, this measuring would have been a promise of God's attempt to restore his relationship with his people. Why is that? They had just lost their capital city, right? It had just been destroyed, right? But now here's God talking about the temple again, right? So, so it would have been an understanding that, that God is actively in the work of restoring his relationship with his people. See, so we, we think of, we, we approach, I think tradition, we've approached um, Revelation as if judgment is a negative thing. As if it's something to fear. Judgment is not something to fear. It's something to get excited about, right? <laughs> it's something to get excited about because if judgment is happening, that means this thing is wrapping up. So all you got to do is understand, and, he, he, and he's already so far in Revelation presented the side. You can have spiritual famine, spiritual death, all kinds of trials and, and horrible things happening to you, or you can have peace that passes understanding even in the midst of tribulation. He's like, so you choose a side, and then on this side, I'm going to restore my relationship with you. But if you're on this side, we're going to see in Revelation, I'm going to judge Babylon. And if you choose to be with Babylon, you're just going to end up in the same place they're going to end up in. Right? <laughs> I mean, how more obvious can he make it? Verse 2, but exclude the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Um, this word exclude is a serious word because it literally, the Greek word that's used here, it's actually a phrase, literally means to cast out or throw out. He's not playing around. It's not like you just kind of, like, excuse me, I'm measuring here and you brush them aside. No, it's an active take them and remove them. But understand and the outer court is where the Gentiles worship. But understand, this is not an eth ethnic statement. Are you with me? So he's not saying you have to belong to a certain ethnic group in order to be counted. This is symbolism and, and allegory. It, 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 is, it is using what would happen in the temple, how the Gentiles had to be in the outer court, and the Jews were allowed in the inner court, as an analogy to the judgment of God. Are you with me? Which is good news. Because some of us like to think we Jews, but I'm fine being a Gentile. I'm fine having roots in Africa. That's okay with me. You know, <laughs> I don't need to co-op anyone else's history. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with who I am. Um, in Revelation, a distinct line is drawn based on what? Worship. See, I'm second, right under the verse there. 
those who worship God on one side and those who worship the dragon and the beast on the other side. And 2 Samuel 8, 2 is a prime example of measuring and judgment. It says in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 8, verse 2, Then he defeated Moab, forcing them down to the ground. He measured them off with a line. He's measuring and making a line. This is we see in Revelation. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death. And with one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. This is harsh language, right? This is judgment. But the beautiful thing is, he's telling you this, God is telling you this ahead of time. Right? So you don't have to be part of the ones that receive eternal punishment. Uh, the, the measuring is for the purpose of determining who will be sealed. This must take place before the righteous can receive their reward. You see what just happened? It happened again. He said, look, there's a side that will receive judgment. The, the negative side of judgment. There's a side that will receive eternal life. Again, Jesus is telling us in Revelation, choose the right side over and over again. He's been doing it for half the book already. So then we get to the two witnesses. This is, this is, this is a fun one, right? Been lots, of, lots of different um, interpretations before, before we read it. Um, I should have put this before. There's been some suggested interpretations throughout time. Some have said it's the Old Testament and New Testament. That's the most popular um, interpretation in our church because that's what, uh, what's his name, who wrote Daniel and Revelation back in the mid-19th century. That's what he said it was. So it's been largely passed pass down. Um, there's some who say it's Elijah and Moses. There's some who say it's Elijah and Enoch. Let's, uh, let's get into the verse, see if maybe the Bible has some clues elsewhere of how to interpret this. Uh, verse 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God, the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. The verses that my beautiful princess read for us earlier. Uh, verse 6. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Uh, so we get to 42 months. We've seen this already repeatedly, right? 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. Are y'all still with me? Uh, Daniel 7 through 9 and Revelation 11 and 13 must be understood in connection with one another. And we're going to get to Daniel 7 in our next present, well, not in our next presentation, after we do uh, Revelation chapter 12. Is that okay? Some of y'all been waiting for Daniel. We're going there. Uh, 42 months is 1260 days, which is also time, time, and half a time of Daniel chapter 7. This time period, which we will get in more in detail when we get to Daniel chapter 7, is generally believed to begin in 538 B.C. when um, the Ostrogoths were defeated and Justinian's decree that the, the Pope was, was going to have all power on the earth was essentially able to, at least in that region, be exercised. Y'all still with me because I'm seeing these heads. Do we need a stretch? We're good? Okay. <laughs> And it's believed, it's generally believed to end is the French Revolution because uh, the, uh, the captain went into the Vatican and told the Pope he no longer is in charge. So people generally put that time period. Uh, we'll, we'll visit this closer in Daniel chapter 7 before we stay to study Revelation 13. I just wanted to put that in there because some of y'all think thought I was going to skip it. Didn't you? Some of y'all thought, <laughs> thought Pastor wasn't going to go there. Is, is he SDA or no? Well, I'll let you know, I'm, I'm going to go there. However, I think that we should be cognizant of something. Just because there may be some historical um, time periods and dates, the dates are not the point. Are you hearing me? 
The dates are not the point. Because there's also some symbolism here that I think is honestly not to suggest other things are not, in, are not correct. I'm not saying that. But there's some symbolism here that I think is a little more relevant to God's last day people in a day-to-day and practical experience. Elijah prophesied for how long? Three and a half years, which was 42 months, right? Um, during the great apostasy of Israel. How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, a time, time, and half a time. With how long Jesus' ministry was. The, and, 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 and what that says to God's last day people is this period of persecution for God's people, this 42 months, these 1,260 days, these three and a half years, gives them hope that though they share their, that, that they share their experience with Jesus and the prophets of old, and if he never left them, Jesus can't leave himself, come on now, but he never left Elijah, he will not leave you. Amen. Amen. So we've had suggested interpretations. Old Testament and New Testament. Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Enoch. Verse 3. And I will give power to my what? Two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in what? Sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. There's an indication right there that you should go somewhere in the Bible and get the interpretation. Um, again, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. Whoever these two olive trees and the, or, or whoever or whatever these two olive trees and two lampstands are is pretty serious because the, whoever harms them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, He must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. All right, let's let's look at the interpretations. In the Jewish court system, there were how many witnesses? Required, right? Have to have at least two witnesses. We've seen that that reference repeatedly so far in Revelation. Um, We find in Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 5 that that God's people are to be the witnesses um, of the word of God, right? Not of whatever we feel like, right? That's the key, right? (laughs) Witnesses of the word of God. Acts spells out the recipe for the church. It really does, which is something we should probably pay attention to because there's some things that were not exactly Acts-like in the way we do church, but that's another conversation for another day. But Acts spells out the recipe for the church, and in Acts, it's very clear that God's people are to be witnesses of the word of God. Um, So these two witnesses are clothed in what? Sackcloth, right? Sackcloth was the traditional garb of prophets in the prophetic office. So whenever a prophet was being a prophet, you know, prophets weren't always prophets, right? That's why it's funny to me how we take literally everything Ellen G. White wrote and see it as prophetic. When she told us not to do that, she was sometimes in her prophetic office, sometimes she was just giving good advice to somebody. You know, (laughs) there's a difference. But but in prophet in the Old Testament, when prophets were in their within their prophetic function of their prophetic office, they wore sackcloth. Um, the text of of Revelation eleven four through six intentionally and specifically points to and echoes Zechariah chapter four verse eleven to fourteen. Can we go there real quick? Can we go to Zechariah real quick? Oh man, like two yeses. Uh, I got a few more laughs. You guys are awake. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 11 to 14. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the what? Lampstands, right? So two olive trees and lampstands, just like we saw in Revelation. And verse 12, and a second time I answered and said to him, 
what are these two branches of the olive tree which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So apparently the, 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 um, um, the olive trees and the lampstands are representative of the two anointed ones. So, okay then, well, that doesn't really take us anywhere, right? <laughs> who are the two anointed ones? Text of Revelation 11, 4 through 6, intentionally and specifically points to Zechariah 4, which we just read. The high priest at the time was Joshua. And the governor at the time was Zerubbabel, right? These two would later play a key role in rebuilding the temple in the time of Nehemiah, Saul and Ezra. Two olive trees in Zechariah represent Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor, who had the responsibility of doing what? Storing the temple. What did we just see in Revelation chapter 11 before we got to the two witnesses? He's measuring the what? The temple, right? He's measuring the temple. You see, all the same things he's referencing, that entire chapter 11 is telling us, is referencing Zechariah chapter 4. The two represent, now stay with me, the two representatives, the, end time, the two witnesses represent the end time people of God in their priestly Joshua and royal Zerubbabel roles. We saw that happen in Revelation chapter 6 as well. As they bear their prophetic witness to what? The word of God. Now, some of y'all are thinking I said something completely different than, than, than what is a lot of times understood that these two witnesses are, the, are Old Testament, New Testament, but I did not. Because in their priestly, first of all, I used the word of God to show you what it's referencing, Zechariah. I didn't say it myself. I showed you. Secondly, in their priestly and royal roles, the, the people of God are not just to proclaim their opinions, but the word of God, which is what? The Old and the New Testament. Amen? So it's not that I took that away. I said, let's just give a three-dimensional picture of it. Because the Bible can sit here all day. My Bible's in my phone now. I'll pretend this is a Bible. The Bible can sit here all day, and it's just going to sit there. But the people of God pick it up, and they absorb it, and then they go to their neighbor, and they start living it. Then it moves forward. Amen? Amen. This also ought to tell you something. This also ought to release fear, because if you look back in Revelation, these two witnesses, God grants them a whole lot of power. When you proclaim the word of God, things happen. You remember, um, what's his name? Was it Elijah with Ahab when he said it's not going to rain? Right? <laughs> right? It, it, uh, it, it, um, um, verse 6, these have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy. We underestimate the power that is upon us. Like, seriously. We run so scared. We always scared of what the devil's doing. I ain't scared of that little imp. Like, seriously. Like, do you understand the power that is in your hands? When you are a, a, a gospel witness, when you are living for Jesus Christ, there is a power that is on you that even the devil himself does not have. You can do things in the name of Jesus the devil wishes he could do, but we run and scared of him. Always, and, you know, a lot of times we limit our ability to share the gospel because we're so scared of the devil. Listen, I, I've been in places where the devil was swimming. He, it, was, it, was, it was his home, but you go in those places. And you ain't on his team. Guess what happened? He runs scared. He really does. You know, I, um, something I love as a, as a kid, and we're going to continue our study in a second, is I love when my, my, um, my mother didn't cook with, with, <laughs> with oil. That's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> my grandma would, <laughs> some of y'all got it. My grandma, she would cook with oil. I love taking the, the dish soap, and you just put a little drop of that dish soap in there, 
And when the dish soap hits the water, what does the oil do? The oil dissipates, right? It runs from the soap, right? And, 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 and I truly believe what we have done is we play the part of the oil instead of the soap. If the, a little drop of the devil come, oh my goodness. I ain't scared of that, that imp. I ain't scared of him. We're supposed to be the soap. I'm not saying you take part in, in what the oil doing, but you be the soap. When you show up, the devil should be running scared. Tell between his legs. I know he ain't got a tell, but they paint him with a tell. Drop his pitchfork, right? <laughs> and run scared, man. And all, look at all that power you got when you carry the word of God. Not when you carry your own opinions. Amen? Continuing on in chapter 11, verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called what? It's called what? Sodom and where also what? Our Lord was crucified. So there's actually three cities named there, right? Then, th then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. All right, the witnesses are killed. The beast arises out of the, the abyss, the what? The bottomless pit. It's the same place we saw the demo demonic locust come from in chapter 9. Remember that? Um, the great city is called Sodom. So going back, um, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of what? The great city, right? Which is called Sodom, Egypt, and where also our Lord was killed. Um, Sodom. I'm going to argue that some would say it represents something, but I'm going to argue it represents injustice, societal, societal neglect of the less fortunate. Where did you get that, Pastor? I got it from Ezekiel chapter 16. Now, now we like to say we know what, Ezekiel, what Sodom's sin was. The Bible says that Sodom's sin was this. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. Hello, Sabbath school lesson, right? We talked about this, that this morning. So Sodom, representing injustice and societal neglect of the less fortunate. Egypt. Egypt, arrogant self-sufficiency. Why did those plagues have to come on Egypt? Just because God wanted to throw some plagues on somebody? No, they, he, Pharaoh felt like he was the man. Like he didn't need God, right? And so God started small, and the plagues, plagues got worse and worse because trying to give Pharaoh's attention, right? Uh, where the Lord was crucified, where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem, professing Christianity under political control. The two prophets tormented them. The effect of the word of God on the conscience of those who willingly refuse them can be torturous, Right? Um, anti-wokeism. Oh, where are you going there with it, Pastor? If you put a label on the desire to help people and say it's woke and then dismiss it, that's anti the character of Christ. Christ is literally about helping people. That was the whole point of the cross. And everything he teaches us is to help people. But when we label it and dismiss it, then we are playing more the role of Sodom than we are the gospel. Three and one half days. This again reminds us of the prophetic work of Elijah and the ministry of Jesus Christ and could also be applied to a specific time period. Uh, verse 11. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same, now, pay attention to this, because I think it's important for us to see the time period 
and I truly believe it's accurate when it comes to 1798. I believe that's, that's accurate, but don't get stuck there as the prophecy begins to move. Are you with me? And they heard, verse 12, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemy saw them. In the same hour, there was a what? Great earthquake. Did it say it happened way after that? It says in the same hour, right? And a tenth of the city fell in the earthquake. 7,000 people were killed, and the rest was afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. This earthquake reminds us of the opening of the sixth seal in chapter 6, which represented what? The second coming of Jesus Christ. We're almost to the end. And the seventh bowl in chapter 16, both of which describe the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's why I believe it's important to see, oftentimes in symbolism, there's dual interpretation. Are you guys still with me now? There's dual interpretation. So, the, the symbolism is taking us to 1798, yes. But the dual interpretation takes us the rest of the way with the three and a half years um, representing the, 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 the ministry of Christ and the, the fact that God stays with his people right up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me? Remember, I told you at the beginning, I'm not telling you you got to believe what, what I believe, right? But I'm showing you and giving you the tools to go form it yourself. Amen? But it's undeniable that here in verse 13, it's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So yes, we got to 1798, but then all of a sudden we're at the second coming of Jesus Christ, and Jesus did not come in 1844, and he sure didn't come in 1798. Amen? Amen. Uh, there's much mystery concerning the time periods. And the meaning of the death of the witnesses, however, we know for sure that Jesus has gone through what we will go through, that Jesus give us strength in the midst of persecution, and that he will one day come to get his people and destroy the wicked powers to harm them. That's the point of it all. And that's why I told you, don't get caught up in dates. Are you with me? Because that's the point of it all. You know what the point of 1844 was? It wasn't 1844. It's that Christ is interceding on our behalf. That was the point of 1844. It was not the year. It was what Christ did in that year and continues to do today. So we get caught up in the dates. And we miss the whole point of the date. Remember this in Revelation 10. Said, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. The contents of the little scroll, scroll will apparently be revealed after the blowing of the second, seventh trumpet. Remember, we talked about Revelation is not always chronological, right? So we, we saw the, the, the connection of the seventh seal was opened, and when the seventh seal opened, then the seven trumpets came, right? And then the seven trumpet will be, will, will be blown, and then the, se the, the, the bowls will happen. That doesn't mean the trumpets come after chronologically the, the seals, and doesn't mean the bowls come chronologically after the trumpet. It's just how it's revealed in Revelation. Um, the seven trumpet is blown in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 to 19, and the, the contents are revealed in Revelation 12 through 22. The mystery of God in the New Testament refers to all of God's promises in the world, his plan of redemption, and his dealing with the sin problem. Paul talks about the mystery of God all the time, right? We're wrapping up. This mystery has puzzled all the universe. The contents of the scroll were sealed for the ages, Romans 6, Colossians 1, and nobody in the universe but Christ was able to open and read it. But by virtue, amen, of his death on the cross, Christ is found worthy to open the sealed mystery and carry out the purpose of God. That's, I basically gave you, and Revelation chapter 11 basically gave you the first half of Revelation over again. Seventh trumpet. You guys remember this at the beginning. Uh, we showed that there's a chiastic structure of Revelation, right? This is a Hebrew literary technique where A corresponds with A. The prologue corresponds with, with the epilogue. B corresponds with B, C corresponds with C, D corresponds with D, um, 
and east corresponds with e. But in the middle, there's something that doesn't have a partner. And, and what, whenever you see that structure, the primary point of it all is the one that doesn't have a partner. And the primary point of all of Revelation is the great controversy between Christ and Satan, right? Okay, keep that in mind because that's exactly where we are right now. And watch what happens. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the, the, the chiastic structure points us to the primary point of revelation. And then when we get there, what it tells us is the kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and he will reign forever and ever. There's revelation for you. Jesus wins. That's the whole point of it all. Right in front of you. Jesus wins. Verse 16, and the 24 elders who sat before God on the throne fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. Look at all this praise being heaped on Jesus. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants. That's you and I, the prophets and the saints. And those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Uh-oh. We like to skip over that part. Shall destroy those who destroy the earth. We, we, again, call the desire to take care of earth wokeism. And shall destroy those who destroy the earth. Verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Again, we are in the middle of it. We're in the whole point of Revelation, and we just had a big old long soliloquy talking about how great Jesus is and how the moment of judgment has come and how he will reward his servants and punish Babylon. Amen. We're done. This session we learned. God draws a distinct line based on worship. God's people are God's last day gospel witnesses. Jesus never abandons his persecuted people. And we, we see the beginning of the finishing of the mystery of God. Amen? Amen. After we eat, we'll come back. Uh, we see a woman giving birth. And we begin to uh, dive into the little school, the second half of Revelation. God bless you. We will have our... Um, Music, a closing hymn, our benediction, and then we can do a Q&A.